So this is going to be chapter 16 and 17 because they're quite small. So 16. Messiahs and means. In a global civilization such as ours, where spiritual knowledge and freedom a bit appear to have been tampered with, there would obviously be a place for someone to develop a useful and understandable body of knowledge about the spirit and the spirit's relationship to the universe. Because verifiable spiritual phenomena seem to be consistent from person to person and from time to time, it is probable that all spiritual realities are rooted in consistent laws and axioms, just like astronomy or physics. If someone were to discover and methodically outline those laws and axioms, he or she would be doing a great service. Such discoveries could open up a whole new science. Would a person who did this be a messiah? Promises of a messiah have been put forth by a great many religions, both maverick and custodial. The word messiah has had several meanings, from simply teacher to liberator. A messiah could be anyone from a person who develops a successful science of the spirit to someone who is actually able to spiritually liberate the human race. Throughout history, there have been thousands of people claiming to be a messiah, or they have been given the label by others, even if they did not claim it themselves. Such messianic claims are usually based upon prophecies recorded earlier in history, such as the Buddhist Maitreya legend, the second coming prophecy of the Book of Revelation, the apocalyptic teachings of Zoroaster, or the Hebrew prophecies. Many people look at all messianic claims with outright scepticism. Others become avid followers of a leader whom they believe to be the fulfilment of a religious prophecy. This raises the question, has there ever been or will there ever be a genuine Messiah? How would one identify such a person? Anyone who successfully develops a functional science of the spirit would obviously have a legitimate claim to the title of Messiah in the teacher sense. There is nothing mystical or apocalyptic about this. A person makes some discoveries and shares them. If this knowledge becomes widely known and results in widespread spiritual salvation, then we enter the realm of the liberator or prophesied messiah. How do we identify such a liberator when there exist so many different prophecies with so many ways to interpret them? The answer is simple. The would-be liberator must succeed. That person must earn the title. It is not God-given. This is a terribly cold and uncomprom uncompromising way of looking at it. It strips away the magic and mysticism normally associated with messianic prophecy. It forces any person who would claim the title of Messiah to actually bring about peace and spiritual salvation because such a prophecy is not going to be fulfilled unless someone causes it ha to happen. This compels the would-be liberator to fully overcome the goals. This is one of the most unenviable tasks that any person could ever hope to undertake. We need only look at past liberators to appreciate the long hard road that such a person must travel. To date, no one has succeeded, but it is certainly a challenge worthy of the best talent. When most people envision a messiah, they see a person dressed in spotless white, who thinks, speaks and behaves in the saintliest of manner. This may be the wrong image to look for in determining whether or not someone has made the discoveries necessary to achieve spiritual salvation. Developing a successful spiritual science would be no different from developing a successful science of aeronautics. The key scientists may not all be saints. Some of them may even be people you would not invite into your home. But their aeroplanes fly. 
it is an irony that important discoveries are often made by unsavoury personalities. Witness, for example, the Scandinavian Vikings, who charted vast unknown regions, but plundered as they went. It follows that a person who might discover a route to spiritual salvation may not be a saint. In fact, it is more likely that such an individual would exhibit as many character flaws as any other person. The test to determine if a route of spiritual recovery has been developed is not the personality of the discoverer. The test is whether that route truly and clearly brings about spiritual recovery in others. There is an idea that proclaiming someone a prophesied messiah is enough to make it true. The logic behind this is that if, if everyone rallies around a single religious leader, harmony and world peace would automatically result. Such a plan sounds good, but history has clearly shown that it does not work. Even followers of the same religious leader are easily split apart into factions, witness to Christians and Muslims. Religion ultimately addresses the survival of the individual spirit, spirit being and, as we shall discuss near the end of this book, the possible survival of the supreme being of some sort. It is therefore easy for people to become quite zealous about religion. There is nothing wrong with that zealousness as long as it is guided by compassion and good sense. We have already seen how several religions initially rooted in very humanitarian ideals had betrayed those ideals and become tyrannies, far worse than any tyrannies the religious had opposed, the religions had opposed. This usually happens when religious adherents believe that the means used to achieve the altruistic goal will always be justified as long as the goal is attained. Their logic seems sensible enough, but is it? It is an unfortunate fact of life that the means will always shape the ends. No matter how noble an end may be, the final result will always re resemble the means used to attain it. It is in this way that some of the most stellar goals can create some of the most oppressive and deadly institutions. A frequent character in literature is the altruistic individual who gradually becomes just like the evils he is fighting because he uses the same means that the enemy is using. This results in our family not being able to tell the difference between an sorry this results in our finally not being able to tell the difference between an altruist and his opponent. We frequently see this phenomenon occur on a larger scale involving organisations and governments. To judge an individual or organisation, therefore, one must do more than merely consider its professed goal or aim. One must also scrutinise the actual day-to-day -day means being used to reach the goal. No matter how sincere the individuals are, what they eventually create will be determined greatly by the means they are using. Interestingly, a group with less lofty aims can sometimes achieve far more good, even more than its own members may have intended. If it is employing honest, constructive means to attaining its purpose. As we can see, an organisation which justifies killing, defamation and Machiavellian manipulations to gain influence and defeat opponents in the name of a higher goal is creating a world in which killing, defamation and turmoil are taking place. On the other hand, a person who believes in always telling the truth so that her knitting club will be respected is creating a world in which truth is being told. Ultimately, the best of all worlds combines a lofty goal with lofty means to attain it, since the accomplishment of a goal usually requires a conscious effort to achieve it. Second to that, noble means to a lesser goal, 
will benefit the world far more than disreputable means to our higher goal. Chapter 17 Flying Gods Over America By the time of the Crusades, major dramas had unfolded on the opposite side of the globe. Great civilizations had come and gone on the American continents. It is difficult to study the history of ancient American civilizations because nearly all original records from those civilizations were destroyed centuries ago. As a result, historians are often confronted with disputes over the most basic facts, such as dates. For example, time estimates regarding the great Mayan civilization have placed it everywhere from 30,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago to only 700 years ago. For the purposes of this book, I will use the dates most commonly accepted by modern historians and archaeologists. Many archaeologists believe that the first important North American civilization was the Olmec Society of Mexico. It is estimated to have flourished from about 800 BC until 400 BC. Very little is known about the Olmecs, except that they left behind impressive ruins, which included a large pyramid. The existence of the pyramid is strong evidence that there was interaction between the old and new worlds in the BC years. The Olmecs are believed to have given birth to the famous Mayan civilization which followed. The Mayan culture extended from Mexico to Central America and lasted from about 300 BC until 900 AD. Like the Olmecs, the Mayans were fond of building pyramids. Surprisingly, some Mayan pyramids were given a limestone facing like the earlier pyramids in Egypt. The Mayans also copied the Egyptians by mummifying bodies and by holding similar beliefs about a physical afterlife, according to historian Raymond Carter. Cartier. Other analogies with, with Egypt are discernible in the admiral art of the Mayas. Their mural paintings and frescoes and decorated vases show a race of men with strongly marked Semitic Mesopotamian features. Engaged in all sorts of activities, agriculture, fishing, building, politics and religion. Egypt alone has depicted these activities with the same cruel verisimilitude, appearance of truth. But the pottery of the Mayas recalls that of the Etruscans, an ancient civilization in Italy. Their bas reliefs remind one of India, and the huge steep stairways of their pyramidal temples are like those at Anchor in Cambodia, dedicated to Hindu worship. Unless they obtained their models from outside, their brains must have been so constructed that they adopted the same forms of artistic expression as all other great ancient civilizations of Europe and Asia. Did civilization then spring from one particular geographical region and then spread gradually in every direction like a forest fire? Or did it appear spontaneously and separately in various parts of the world? Were some races the teachers and others the pupils, or were they self-taught, isolated seeds, or one parent stem giving off shoots in every direction? The coincidences are far too strong for the American civilizations to have arisen independently of the old world societies. Jungian theories of a collective unconscious are hardly satisfactory. The striking similarities indicate that the American civilizations were part of a global society, even if ancient American inhabitants were not aware of it. A similar situation exists today, 
in different cities around the world. We find modern skyscrapers that look remarkably alike no matter where on the globe they stand. From Singapore to Africa to the United States, it can be rather a surprise to see in a remote African nation a tall glassy skyscraper that is virtually identical to a skyscraper in Chicago. The surrounding culture, however, may be radically different in each country, indicating that the skyscraper in Africa is not a product of the native African culture, but is the product of an independent global influence. A similar global influence clearly existed more than a millennium ago, as evidenced by the remarkable similarities between ancient Mayan and Egyptian cultures. That global influence appears to have been custodial, because as soon as we review ancient American writings, we encounter once again our custodial friends. Custodians were worshipped by ancient Americans as human-like gods, who hailed from other worlds. As in the Eastern Hemisphere, custodians in America were eventually disguised by a cloak of mythology. As in Egypt and Mesopotamia, custodial servants in America were the priests who held considerable political power because of their special relationship to mankind's reported extraterrestrial masters. It is therefore not surprising to find evidence that the Brotherhood existed in ancient Americas. For example, the snake was an important religious symbol throughout the ancient Western Hemisphere. Several Freemasonic historians claim evidence of early Masonic rites in pre-Columbian societies. The Brotherhood symbol of the swastika was also prominent. As Professor W. Norman Brown of the University of Pennsylvania points out on page 27 of his book, The Swastika, a study of the Nazi claims of its Aryan origin. A curious problem lies in the presence of the swastika in America before the time of Columbus. It is frequent in northern, central and southern America and has many, many variant forms. The American civilizations had a history similar to that of the Old World. It was filled with wars, genocides and calamities. Cities and religious centres in ancient America came and went. One thing that remained consistent was the building of pyramids. The Toltecs, a civilization which arose from the Mayan society, continued the pyramid building tradition and constructed the fabulous Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico. This pyramid is larger than the Great Pyramid of Egypt in sheer bulk and is crafted with the same stone cutting precision that characterizes its Egyptian counterpart. When the Spaniards invaded America in the 16th century, they deliberately destroyed nearly everything they could of the ancient American cultures, except for the gold and precious metals which were shipped to Spain. At that time in history, the Inquisition was at its height and Spain was its most zealous advocate. The ancient Americans were considered pagan, and so Christian missionaries engaged in an energetic campaign to destroy all records and artefacts related to the American religions. Unfortunately, those records included priceless history and science texts. The effect of this obliteration was much like the destruction of the Alexandra Library by Christians earlier. It created a substantial blackout regarding some of mankind's ancient history. This has left a great many unanswered questions about the Mayans. For example, the Mayans built many fabulous religious centres and then abandoned them. Some historians believed that the abandonment was done suddenly and that its cause remains a mystery. Others conclude that it was done gradually as the Mayan society decayed. The Mayans were also known to practice human sacrifice. Some historians believe that the sacrifices were an infrequent ritual, 
Others think that the sacrifices amounted to full-scale genocide, claiming 50,000 lives per year. Where does the truth lie? One book has surfaced, which purports to be a record of ancient Mayan beliefs. It is known as the Popol Vuh. Council Book The Popol Vuh is not a, gen a genuinely ancient work. It was first written in the 16th century by an unknown Mayan. It was later translated into Spanish by Father Francisco, Francesco Ximenez of the Dominican Order. Ximenez's translation was first published in Vienna in 1857 and is the earliest surviving version of the Popol Vuh. The Popol Vuh is said to be a collection of Mayan beliefs and legends as they had been passed down orally through the centuries. It is clear, however, that many Christian ideas were incorporated into the work, either by the original unknown Mayan author, by Father Ximenez, or by both. It is, of, it is also obvious that the Popol Vuh contains many tales of pure fiction mixed in with what is said to be true story of the creation of man. Nevertheless, several segments of the Popol Vuh are worth considering because they repeat important religious and historical themes we have seen elsewhere, but with far greater sophistication than is found in Christian writings. Those themes are expressed by the Popol Vuh within the context of the multiple, multiple gods of the ancient Mayas. The Popol Vuh states that mankind had been created to be a servant of the gods. The gods are quoted. Let us make him who shall nourish and sustain us. What shall we do to be invoked in order to be remembered on earth? We have already tried with our first creations, our first creatures, but we could not make them praise and venerate us. So then, let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who will nourish and sustain us. According to the Popal view, the gods had creatures known as figures of wood before creating Homo sapiens, said to look and talk like men. These odd creatures of wood existed and multiplied. They had daughters, they had sons. There's a footnote. According to Sumerian text, Homo sapiens resembled custodial bodies. This may explain why the gods of the Popol Vuh were successful with Homo sapiens, but not with the other types of bodies. Spiritual beings were more willing to inhabit bodies which resembled those they had already animated before. They were, however, inadequate servants for the gods. For the gods. To explain why, the Popol view expresses a sophisticated spiritual truth not found in Christianity, but which is found in earlier Mesopotamian writings. The figures of wood did not have souls. Relates the Popol view, and so they walked on all fours aimlessly. In other words, without souls, spiritual beings, to animate the bodies, the gods found they had created living creatures which could biologically reproduce, but which lacked the intelligence to have goals or direction. I've got a picture of an NPC if you're not looking. The gods destroyed their figures of wood and held lengthy meetings to determine the shape and composition of their next attempt. The gods finally produced creatures to which spiritual beings could be attached. That new and improved creature was Homo sapiens. Creating Homo sapiens did not end custodial headaches. However, according to the Popal view, the Homo sapiens were too intelligent and had too many abilities. They, first Homo sapiens, were endowed with intelligence. They saw and instantly, instantly they could see far. They succeeded in seeing. They succeeded in knowing all that there is in the world. When they looked, instantly they saw all around them. 
and they contemplated in turn the arch of heaven and the round face of the earth. But the Creator and the Maker did not hear this with pleasure. It is not well that our creatures, our works, say they know all. The large and the small, they said, something had to be done. Humans, and by implication the spiritual beings that animate human bodies, needed to have their level of intelligence reduced. Mankind had to be more stupid. Well, they succeeded in that. What shall we do with them now? Let their sight reach only to that which is near. Let them see only a little of the face of the earth. It is not well what they say. Perchance are they not by nature simple creatures of our making? Must they also be gods? And if you're not looking, I've got a little picture of the um, visual of the visual light spectrum, the small bit of light that we can see compared to what there actually is. Maybe that's what they meant. So we couldn't see into the ultraviolet or the infrared, etc. The Popal View then tells in symbolism what custodians did not did to early Homo sapiens to reduce human intelligence and intellectual vision. I'll read that again. The Popal View then tells in symbolism what custodians did to early Homo sapiens to reduce human intelligence and intellectual vision. Then the heart of heaven blew mist into their eyes, which clouded their sight as when a mirror is breathed upon. Their eyes were covered and they could see only what was close, only that was clear to them. In this way, the wisdom and all of the knowledge of the four men, first Homo sapiens, were destroyed. The above passages echo the biblical Adam and Eve story in which revolving swords had been placed to block human access to important knowledge. It also suggests a custodial intention that human beings should never learn about the world beyond the obvious and superficial, I'd say beyond the material. The Popal View contains another element worth mentioning because it reflects the muddling of languages theme of the Biblical Tower of Babel story. The Popal View relates that various gods spoke different languages which the ancient Mayan tribes were compelled to adopt whenever they fell under the rule of a new god. Even in the New World, humans were broken into different linguistic groups by the custodial gods. By the time the Spaniards first landed in the Americas in the late 15th century, the custodial gods were no longer directly visible in human affairs and had not been so f so for centuries. Although UFOs continued to be observed around the world, people no longer viewed them as the vehicles of the gods. The custodial race assumed a low profile, which made it seem as though they had left the earth and gone back home. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, they still remained, as the next and perhaps most ominous chapter reveals. The next chapter, chapter 18, is called The Black Death. Monkeys, anyone? <laughs>